and how do we how do believers live and respect matters of conscience? Um, we've touched on that already, and Paul has done more with that. And so I've decided. To, I mean, not not that this is just a simple repetition. There's more there, but I decided that instead of focusing on the whole chapter, we'll just focus our attention on chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. And this is um, this deals with a couple of related themes. This is really looking at Israel's history as a type or as a pattern for the church. And so what I want us to do is read through it, and then um, I'll do what we've been doing. I'll give you a few minutes to just kind of look back and see if you can note any of those transition points or any of those themes that um, emerge. Um, but I'm just trying to set the table for you a little bit here and kind of prepare you. So it's lessons from history, but then Paul also is going to touch on what this means in part on um, his theology of the Lord's Supper, but this is only here it's really only, he's only brushing up against that, um, and he's going to come back and do a little more with the Lord's Supper a little later on. So um, so in a nutshell, that's what that's what we're looking at. Now I'd like to have a couple volunteers. I think that we probably could use three volunteers, someone to read 1 through 10, and then maybe um, 11 through six, 11 through 17, and then 18 through the end. So who, who'd like to read? Okay, I've got Bruce and David. I need one more reader. Bruce, I'll have you read one through uh, one through 10. Who'd like to, and then David, you read 11 through 17. Who can read 18 through the end for us? Who'd be willing to do that? All right, Jerry. All right, go ahead. Start us off, Bruce. Good, thank you. Um, so I'm going to give you maybe three to five minutes to go back through this text. Haley, would you put the next slide up? And what I want you to just pay attention to are a couple of things. That there's, first of all, those structural words, words like therefore and uh, so then, those kind of things that mark off transitions of thought in the text. See if you can identify a few of those, and, and that will kind of help us determine the structure of this text, but also be looking for those repeated words or those repeated phrases, and that will give us 
kind of an understanding of the, the main emphasis or the focus of this text. So, um, so go ahead and take a couple minutes and do that, and then we'll, um, we'll pick back up and see if we can join together and figure out what Paul is getting at. And you can work with the people that you're sitting around too. Don't feel like you have to do this in silence by yourself. One more minute. All right, let's, um, I, know, I know it's a long passage and I know three minutes is not nearly enough time to really dig into it, but let's see what you find out. Um, either structural words or repeated words um, for emphasis. What did you find, David? <coughs> yep. Yes, that's right. Yeah, in fact, the example there is r the whole phrase is almost the same in uh, in 6 and again in 11, right? Now, these things took place as examples. Now, these things happened to them as examples. So that's a key idea there that Paul is, is looking at history and saying this is something we need to learn from today. In fact, he even seems to be saying that one of the main reasons this all happened was for us today as an example. So, yeah, Paul. Okay, sure. Yeah, so it's it's probably a matter of of interpretation. I mean, you in other words, um, the word was probably should, but it's it's meant to carry the imperative force there. It, it should be read with that. You know, this isn't just an opinion. You can't do this. It should be read as a as a command not to do it. Um, so it, it's one of these things where yeah, there are different Greeks a little different that way. I mean, it can have Sometimes you can have a word that is in um, the subjunctive, which is a let us or let us not, but it's meant to carry the imperative force. So my guess is, without um, knowing right off the top of my head, I would guess that's probably what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. Right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's not God's sort of minor preference. It's That's right. And that's right, that's a good reminder because we operate under that principle that Scripture interprets Scripture. And so um, we always have to be using the other parts of the Bible to explain, you know, the, the, the passages that we're looking at. And it's also a reminder, too, and this is a little more related, it's a little less related, but I think it's still relevant, and that's that the less clear passages have to be understood in light of the more clear passages. So if you come to a text in the Bible that seems a little fuzzy and you're not quite sure what that means, um, 
then you go to the passages that are a little more clear and a little more direct and easy to understand, and then that shines light on the passage that's a little more fuzzy in your mind, rather than doing it the other way around. You see what I'm saying? Um, so good, good observation. What else? What, uh, what else did you come up with? Repeated words or structures? It's how not to be. That's right. There's a lot of warnings. So what are the warnings? And, and maybe that's just because we are a little short on time. Maybe that's a good transition into, um, Haley, go two slides ahead because I think we'll, we'll save that picture for another time. Um, Paul, is he's using Israel as a type. Uh, and a type is just a way of saying, it usually refers to something in the Old Testament, uh, and it's a pattern that points to a bigger reality in the New Testament. So like the priest is a type of Christ. It's, um, it, it's sort of a sketch or a thumbnail sketch of the reality. And Paul is, is taking that idea and he's saying the Israelites were a type. They were a pattern that the church in the New Testament has to learn from. So he's making a connection between the Israelites and the church. And then he's, what Margie's saying, he's getting at that whole how not to be. In other words, learn from the Old Testament people and from the mistakes that they made. Now let's dig into that a little bit. Using our text, what are the advantages that the Israelites enjoyed in the wilderness? What does Paul tell us? Yeah, Jerry. Yep. Right. So by my count, I have five times Paul says they all, and then he lifts a benefit, right? Under the cloud, through the sea, baptized in the cloud and in the sea, ate the spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink. So, um, so they all had these benefits. Now the question is, what, is, what does Paul mean by that? What, what were those benefits in, in actuality? What, what, does he, what do you suppose he means by that? What does it mean to be baptized in, under the cloud, for example, or drinking the spiritual food and spiritual drink? What does he mean by that? I guess you don't drink spiritual food, but eating the spiritual food and drinking the spiritual drink. What does he mean by that, do you think? Yeah, what and what should have been enough? That's right. It even talks about Christ in there, right? Yep, it comes, that, comes back to that later on. That's right. So there's God's provision there, right? He's giving them everything they needed that they didn't need to doubt or question. I saw, I think John's hand up and then Jerry's hand up. So what else? Right. Right. So all those Israelites enjoyed God's deliverance, right, from Egypt and through the Red Sea and his leading through by way of the cloud um, and his provision by way of food and drink, right, manna and quail in the wilderness, right? And um, so all those benefits. Jerry, I think you had one or two that you were going to add to that as well. That's, that covers it, yeah. So, so it's, it's protection, it's, it's belonging, right? Because when God leads him through the Red Sea, like John points out, that's a baptism picture, which um, one of the things that that means is that they come together as a people. They are now one nation. Um, so they, they have an identity. They've been delivered. They are being cared for, provided, protected, all of those things. But what happened? Um, so those are the advantages. But, um, but what, what happened to the people um, in spite of all of that, look at uh, starting in about verse 7. This is the part where we sort of shake our heads and say, what did they do, right? Um, John. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. And he, in fact, even when Moses was still up on the mountain, you know, he's having this encounter with God, and 
you know, first the Israelites are terrified. They don't want to get near too near to God. And then, well, they start waiting, get impatient. And then they build this golden calf. They build an idol in spite of everything that God had given. Um, and that's, so in fact, Haley, go, um, go one more slide ahead. Just, I'm going to, I'll use this real quick. So four little things there. And, and there, those are, those relate to each of the four things. Do not, we must not, we must not, um, uh, nor grumble. So at the, verses seven through uh, 10 list each of those. And each one of those is a reference to an event in Israel's history in which they, in spite of all that God had done for them, they had failed. So uh, Deuteronomy or uh, Exodus 32, that's the first one. That's the golden calf. And, and uh, what Paul is quoting there, he says, as it is written, people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's, that's a quote from De- Deuteronomy, the story of the golden calf. Um, Indulging in sexual immorality, uh, as some of them did, and 23,000 of them fell in a single day. That's an occasion with the Moabite people when they're out on the plains, um, and the whole of Israel are, and it's told in uh, Numbers 25, the whole of Israel gets up, and many of them were um, practicing all kinds of sexual immorality with the uh, Moabite people, and God uh, sends a plague upon them, and it's, it's a really dramatic story. In fact, while the people are repenting of this one of the men gets up and he actually goes in to continue his sexual immorality with this woman and then um it's um phineas i believe is his name he stabs the man to death in the who's committing this sin um he stabs him to death right there in the middle of it and and we're told that that was a way that god um stemmed his anger against the people but it's a very graphic and a very vivid story but it's, it's another one of these incidents in Israel's history in which the people had gotten so far away from how God had called them to live in spite of what they had, um, and what, what God had done for them. Um, putting God to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, that's told in Numbers 21. You're familiar with that story where the people are complaining about what God had done and they're testing him and then God sends the plague of uh, serpents among the people. And then finally, grumbling against God, that's uh, complaining. It seems complaining about the food um, or the, what they perceived as a lack of food. So four instances, and they all seem to have a direct reference into the Old Testament. Um, now, the question is, and maybe Haley can go back to um, go back to the previous slide. The question then, of course, is, so Paul isn't just standing up front as a history teacher giving history. He's using these as a warning. So what do you think are... Well, first of all, what do you think of the, the blessings that God's people enjoy that Paul would be making a connection to? What, what's he trying to, what parallels is he trying to make as far as what God has done for his people? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, that's right. So it's, I mean, the gift of God's son, Jesus, right? What else, Jerry? Right, that's exactly right. There's that type idea again. Delivery from Egypt, bigger delivery from bigger enemy. That's right. So salvation in Jesus, what else? Any other thoughts on this? What else do we We enjoy salvation? What else do we enjoy from, from God? What other benefits do we have? We have the word, that's right. Yeah, anything else, Jerry? Gift of the Holy Spirit, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you go to other parts of the world you know, to uh, greater or lesser degrees, that's restricted sometimes. You're right. Um, what else, David? Yeah, that's right. So m- many of these, are, well, all of these are major advantages. What's Paul's caution then? What's he worried about? Um, as he as he says, okay, you know, here's what Israel enjoyed, and they, you know, they had all the same blessings, and yet they fell in the wilderness. What is Paul's worry for the Corinthians and for us? He he doesn't want history to repeat itself. That's right, but it does. Um, now, how might history repeat itself? What are some of the ways that Paul might see this happening in the Corinthians? Remember some of the things we've touched on already, right? Was sexual immorality a problem in the Corinthian church? Yeah, it was actually, Paul says, you guys are doing things that even the pagans are kind of grossed out by. I mean, that's, that's 
what he says right back in chapter 7. Um, was idolatry a problem in Corinth? Yeah, big problem because remember, I, it's been a few, probably a couple months since I put that slide up, but remember the picture of the canal that reminds us that Corinth was a port city and they had all kinds of people from all around the world coming into Corinth and bringing their, their religion with them. And so the Corinthians were pulled by all kinds of idols. Um, Corinthians, did they doubt or question God's faithfulness to his people? Well, probably, right? I mean, I suppose that, that seems to make sense given the context here. Um, yes, yes, good. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that, that danger, we call it syncretism, where we try to blend um, historic Orthodox Christian worship with sort of worldly ideas, and you just sort of try to mix them together like splicing a gene together or something like that, and it doesn't work. Um, yeah, David. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's right. So some of the historical context here kind of sheds light on the second part of the passage, which is where Paul comes along and he says, okay, I know that, because um, he's already talked about what do you do if you, you know, you go to the meat market and some of the meat is discounted because it's been used in, you know, worship at the temple's can we eat that? And Paul says, yeah. I mean, if it's not going to cause people of weaker faith to stumble, then go ahead. But now he comes back and, and he's answering sort of the, the second layer to that question, which is, okay, you know, should we go up and participate in these big feasts at the temple? You know, maybe your neighbor invites you to go to church with them at the idol, at, at the pagan temples, and to eat meat as part of these sacrifices. And Paul's, his response to that is, you know what, the meat or the idols are nothing. I mean, it's meat and it's stone. So in the one sense, Paul's saying, you know, it's, I, I realize that it's not anything substantive. But what he goes on is he says, when you're gathering together with all these people and you're participating in these rituals and in these rites, you are actually sharing with the demons. So, um, and, and Paul will come back to that when he talks more in depth about his theology of the Lord's Supper. But here he's kind of getting at the idea, sort of a more basic when you gather together and you're participating in these worship services, there's something transcendent going on. There's something supernatural. You are eating and drinking with demons. And Paul says, I don't want you doing that. You ought not to be doing that. That's what the Israelites were doing. So run away from that. Don't have any part of that. Um, and then, as I said, he will come back and develop that idea further when he wants to talk about the, the real problem with um, in, in, what the real problem in Corinth with the Lord's Supper, which was, they were turning these into um, pretty uh, boisterous feasts and festivals. So he's going to come back, but he's building that idea here in terms of participating with demons. Yeah, John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so you're, you're looking at verse 12 there, right? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, here's a couple of thoughts that I think get at what you're, what you're pointing out, because you're bringing out one of these key tensions, which is, okay, if, if we are saved people, if we're a redeemed people, and if we do believe you can't ever lose your salvation, then how do we guard against apathy and laziness and saying, well, you know, I'm saved, so nothing can change that, so it doesn't really matter how I live. And I think there are a couple of things we take from that. Um, first of all, earlier in the text where Paul talks about all the benefits that the Israelites enjoyed, he, he's reminding, I think, one of, the, one of the implications of that is that just because you are part of the visible people does not mean that you are actually one of God's elect, is maybe how we would say it today. Um, because Paul is saying, look, all these people were part of this visible community of people that passed through the, the waters, but they never entered their rest. They never entered the promised land. So by analogy, then, I think what that means is a warning to some people who might be saying, well, look, you know, I'm in. I, you know, I go to church every Sunday. I'm a good person. Um, you know, I give money to the poor. And um, so I don't really have to worry about what kind of life I live. It doesn't really matter. And I think there would be the warning uh, that says, just because you're part of the visible membership, just because you're part of the visible body, don't let that make you too comfortable. That's number one. Number two, I think, because um, that, you know, there are still people that I think are elect that need to hear the warning, because I think the warning is, take heed that you don't fall into the temptation, because temptation can destroy me. You give in to temptation. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that God loves you any less, but it might mean that he is less pleased with you, and it might also mean that the effects of sin are, you invite destruction into your life. You're inviting all kinds of brokenness and chaos, and, and God allows us to experience that because that's, uh, you know, for, for numerous reasons. So I think what Paul is saying is, you know, don't let yourself be complacent. Don't let yourself, you know, drift into sin just because, you know, you're, you know, you consider yourself one of God's people. And then the flip side of that becomes um, not only take heed lest you fall, but when God is giving you the resources that you need, when he is faithful and he will give you what you need to overcome temptation, then why not take advantage of that? Why not receive what God is giving there? Right? You see how that works. It's not just take heed, you know, warning. It's, there's a warning, and you don't need to fall into that because God will help you when you are tempted. Yeah, David. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. That's right. No, that's exactly right. There are lots of warnings of people who, who were in and who were either in because they sort of deluded themselves into thinking they were in just because they were part of the bigger group or who genuinely were in but became complacent. And there are plenty of warnings from Scripture that say don't, don't give in to temptation lest you fall and lest it you know, bring all kinds of ruin into your life. So, yeah, Margie. That's right. Right. 
Right, right. Right, that's right. Right. That's right. That's right. It, it, so, so the analogy is the difference between standing in front of a judge who could pass sentence on you and you're trying to say, well, listen, you know, I've been a, all the rest of my life, I've done a lot of good things and so maybe take that into account and don't pass the sentence on me. Or standing in front of a father and saying, you know, look at what I've done. I wanted to please you because you love me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gospel realities create gospel right. obedience, right? The salvation is first. Yeah. Right. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. It's, yeah. John. <clears throat> Right, yeah. Well, sure, yeah. I don't, I don't mean to pit them entirely apart, right? I mean, I, I think you're right. I think there is more similar than there is different, although I think, you know, we have the advantage of looking through the lens of the cross and standing on the other side of, of Calvary. So we have things that even the Israelites didn't have. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the, the, we, we sometimes, we do that actually way too often where we just make this sharp disconnect. Well, that's Old Testament. That doesn't matter. That was No, 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 no. They are joined together in, in including in what you're getting at, which is, you know, we today as believers have a lineage that goes into the Old Testament people. They're, that's our heritage in a very real sense. Um, we might not be Jewish genetically, but uh, spiritually, that is our lineage. Uh, we go back to that. So you're right. Yeah, that's a good good point. All right. Um, we are uh, we have to wrap up. We're past time. So um, we'll come back. Um, oh, you can Haley, you can put the last slide up, and this kind of just sums it up. Uh, three three things that Paul is making: flee from idolatry because it destroyed the Israelites or a generation. Fee, flee from the idol feasts and the pagan temples. Uh, Paul doesn't want the, the believers doing that, practicing that syncretism, that blending of uh, historic Christian uh, worship with pagan things, and then persevere in, in fidelity and in faithfulness to God. Um, we'll come back next week and we'll talk a little more about um, the theology of the Lord's Supper. No, not next week, two weeks, force of habit, thank you. Uh, two weeks from tonight, we'll come back and we'll develop some of the theology of the Lord's Supper and in worship. Um, let's, uh, let's pray together as we conclude this portion of our service.